Welcome back to Beyond the Wrench. My name is Jay Ganinen, and I am your host. Today's guest is Adam Bryant, shop foreman of Enzing Kia in Northampton, New Hampshire. Together, Adam and I are going to talk about a variety of different topics, including technician training programs, tool debt, and how to have patience with young technicians. Adam, uh, thanks for joining me uh, second time on the show. How you been? I've been doing really well, thank you. No complaints. So the, the first time you were on the show, it was actually the third episode that we ever released in 2020. 2020 was a fairly chaotic year for those of you uh, that were under a rock. Uh, COVID had happened and we were just getting the uh, the podcast launched and rolling. So what have you been up to? Oh, uh, well, going through that experience, um, you know, as a parent and as a uh, technician, so it was, it was a crazy couple of years. Um, but yeah, other than that, it was uh, spent my time with um, Toyota, still working on retention and students and uh, my own career, which has been great. And then obviously recently my newest transition. So it's been a busy couple of years, that's for sure. Yeah, that's uh, in, in the intro. For those of you that listened to the first episode three years ago, three plus years ago, uh, you went from Toyota to Kia. How, uh, how has that gone? Um, it's good. Uh, it's more of, it was a, it was a uh, growth decision, uh, overall. I've been with Toyota my entire career and they have always, it, it's been a good manufacturer. I've had a great experience with them. Um, I've only been in two different dealers in the duration of time and the transition to Kia is, um, it's an adjustment for sure. Um, but you just got to rely on your ability to do the job and, and that every car is just a car at the end of the day. So it's good. Make you think a little bit more now. Uh, you, you probably uh, at some level were a little bit on <laughs> autopilot, uh, being used to the same cars forever. Correct. I would say for sure. That is probably the biggest adjustment. Yeah. I would say that the autopilot was, uh, could definitely come in on certain days. And, uh, this is definitely not that. No, not at all. <laughs> this is a very, very start to finish day that is very busy, but it's good. It kind of revitalizes my, my, um, uh, my opinion of the industry and trying to get, you know, kind of push back into things. And it's good. I'm, I'm excited about it. I don't, I think one thing that hasn't changed, even though you've changed manufacturers in terms of what dealership you're at, uh, is your desire to raise young technicians and bring more people into the industry. And, and I think that was one thing that kind of resonated with me in the first episode that we had done was, uh, your passion for the industry as a whole, uh, has that carried over between dealerships? I, I know that's one thing that you've kind of held close to your heart for, for a long time. Uh, feels like you've kind of uh, run with that as you've made this transition as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it absolutely was something that I wasn't, if I was making the transition to another manufacturer, it was something that I was not going to um, walk away from at all. I have, a, I have a very invested interest in a lot of the younger people. Um, again, back to our older podcast, I, I was there. We were all there at one point in time. And I really don't, uh, I don't think it's an easy industry to navigate. Uh, and I think that going through and, and meeting the right people and, and having the right conversation um, really bridges a lot of gaps for the younger students and the, the kids that are coming from a different manufacturer um, or that aren't sure if they want to do this for a career uh, or, in, or go into post-secondary education. So there's, you know, be, be, between being a younger kid and trying to figure out if you want to go to college or if this is your career and a lot of other decisions in life that you're looking at doing um you need somebody there to help you point you in the right direction or at least give you some advice and see if it helps you so it's been it's been very rewarding um and i do i do thoroughly enjoy it yeah for sure do you think it's harder for young techs coming in today versus when we were growing up and coming into the industry just in general um Wow, good question. I would say, huh. no, not as hard. I don't think it is as hard. I think that when we were coming into the industry, there was a lot less information. And information now has provided a gateway, whether it be through technical service bulletins, repair manuals online, electrical wiring diagrams, interactive electrical wiring diagrams, recall service campaigns. There's so much information that you're able to use as a guide for diagnostic. Uh, online modules, certain things that you can go back and reference um, where the, those weren't there. <laughs> the repair manual was there, 
but technical service bulletins weren't a thing. Um, recalls weren't really, I mean, they just were there, but they weren't as prevalent as they are now. Um, so as a, is there certain, it's kind of like a double edged sword. The, the information is there and that's better. Um, is the expense and the cost of the point of entry more expensive? It is. Um, so there's, you know, a win on one end and, and a loss on the other. So it, it, it's finding a balance there, sure. So it's been a while since I've been in a shop every day, but based on what I hear from tax, I think w another piece of that that's changed has been maybe the acceptance from uh, more experienced techs that maybe we didn't see when we were coming in. Uh, you know, I think it was pretty common to say, you know, hey, I learned the hard way, you need to learn the hard way. And I, I feel like it's changing a little bit, but you're in a shop every day, you tell me if I'm wrong. It's changing because there are people like myself, like we discussed in the podcast back then, that there are, you know, there's that gap of a generational divide, right? Where there's a little bit of older people that were going out and younger people coming in. And there's this middle group that we're kind of, we got the experience from one end and we understand where the other one's coming from and we're kind of filling that void. So I do think that there is a difference there. Are there still people out there that believe that? Yeah, there are. There are. And there's nothing <laughs> we can do about that. But that those are the people that aren't looking to do anything besides worry about what they need to worry about. They're not looking to um, grow the shop, look for uh, additional help. You know, that's just not their position. So finding the right person within the shop atmosphere is crucially important to those younger people. One thing I will give credit to shops for over the past few years is it at least feels like they're trying, right? And in a lot of cases, I think the perception amongst technicians is, you know, all shops are the same. They're going to treat me this way. And, I, you know, I, I just don't love it. But we hear the other side of it, too. And I think there are a lot of shops out there that are actively trying to change how happy their technicians are and maybe being more intentional about it than they had in the past. Oh, I agree. hundred percent. Yep. There's definitely some, some significant improvement in that, um, that they are more aware of the educational expense, the tool expense, the overall point, the, the point of entry for these people to come in and get a job, uh, is very, it's, 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 it's expensive. And, it has to change, right? I mean, we've talked about the, you know, the the um, employment rate, people paying a certain amount for, you know, um, employees, whether it be minimum wage or not, and how that's developed over just the last three years. And you and I had a conversation. Um, yeah. Those kinds of career paths, putting those in place, and then focusing on how you can get them there. And yeah, I think there's definitely more involvement on the dealer and some independent shops as well. They do know that it is expensive. And they don't necessarily, you know, you don't ask a lot of people to come to work with 20 grand in their pocket to go get a job. So it's tough. Yeah, I think just being empathetic of what the position is, is is really, really big if you're mm -hmm. that young technician coming in. Um, and I also just kind of feel like it was forced growth, right? This technician shortage is tough on a lot of us in the industry. But at some level, it kind of had to happen for things to change. If it just would have been an abundance of techs all around forever, you probably wouldn't see some of this growth that we've seen in shops. And so it, it, it uh, I think, was forced a little bit on most shops to adapt and, and make it, you know, make their offering a little bit different than it had been in the past. But, you know, from my, my viewpoint and what I've seen over the years is that, you know, the technician shortage stinks, but it also probably forced some really good things to come through in these shops. True. Yeah, I agree 100% on that. As there, there is a lot of, um, there was a benefit to it. And it's, it's, still, it's still there, but it's, yeah, there's just more involvement that's needed to um, fill those voids. So walk me through this new role that you've got at Engzing Kia. Uh, you, mm -hmm. You've stepped into a foreman type of role. Yep. Uh, what what does that mean, and and uh, how is that kind of playing in your mind as far as your career progression and, and seeing what you know that next opportunity was going to be for you? Uh, yeah, I think it more it was more. So there's a there's a couple of different gaps within the industry, and one of the gaps in the industry is, is as people 
work through the technician thing, they may decide at some point in their career that that's not what they want to do long term, or they may have reached a point in their career where they just are looking for a change. And those changes could be within the parks department, within the service department, whether it's service managing, service advising, sales, whatever. There's other facets to reduce the amount of attrition within a dealership or within a company. And I believe that even back when we were, when we were talking on that previous podcast, that cross training, giving people the other option to learn other things, whether it be finance or go in and explore, you know, service and explore parts. Those are things that people, you know, get a chance to just, I guess, really transition within your company and stay within your company, but go do something in a different capacity. So I had done the technical side and again, had reached that pinnacle with Toyota for you know a long time, and it and it was still challenging. There was a lot of things there, and I, and I changed in that process to doing more dealer product reporting, and more involved with the manufacturer. And then I was also taking on more of the young kids. That was just my own opportunity to grow as a person, as a technician, to try to, um, yeah, to try to grow. And this position moving over to Enzyme Kier now is a foreman position. And before I had been in a team leader position, which was controlling shop flow, dispatching of work from an average of two technicians to eight technicians, depending on the size of the teams that we had. This, this shop is small too. I would say right now we've only got seven or eight technicians. We have the base to go to 12 technicians. And we're looking to progressively grow that business and um, looking at new buildings and features down the road. So. There's just an opportunity for me to do some more front of the house work, which it would be some of the repair order stuff and some more interactions with the day to day, flow of the shop, scheduling of the shop, making sure the work gets done in that process. And it brought it back to a smaller group size. So I'm definitely making very large impacts very quickly. So very happy with it. I'm guessing that's meaningful, right? When when you're doing stuff to see that there there is an impact and there is a, d- a direct reflection of the work that you're putting right. in. Yeah, and I, and I think that like those impacts that I found with a, with a bigger dealer group were coming from my involvement with the students, and I would see that they would pass their ASDs or they would have their wins, and we would have wins together, and we would you know there's those week to week things, but this is definitely a significant change. Um, the dealer, you know, buying, going in at an entry level where the dealer was just purchased within the last couple of months and going in and trying to start it from the bottom and work its way up is, is, it's definitely some work. It's some work for sure. But I think the rewards, you could see them very quickly, which is good. It is a good feeling. How hard was it to leave behind the work in the, the people that you had put, you know, kind of in training and raise them up to be good technicians and, and, kind of walking away, right? Like it, it's hard yeah. to leave any job, I feel like, for the most part because of the relationships you build. But when you are personally vested in, in growing those people, that's mm-hmm. got to be a tough decision. And that's the thing. I think everybody in the automotive industry, and I watched this and swipe the brush that big. I think there's a lot of people in the industry that actually um, stay and stay for those reasons. And they are – you're right, I am invested in those students, but I still text those students, we still talk, I still check when they do their ASDs, if they're passing them or not. They still call because they're looking for advice. I'm still somebody who is very impressionable in what they did, and I take that, I, I can hang my hat on that for sure, and I actually really enjoy the fact that we still catch up outside of that aspect of, again, I'm here to help you. I, when I when I got on board, I decided it was going to be a long term thing. It wasn't going to be just for a couple of months, you know. So I'm glad that they reach out and they have those questions and concerns. I did a product for a really long time. The knowledge didn't just walk away the day that I went with me. You know what I mean? So I do feel like there's a responsibility on my end to see those things through as well. Um, am I taking on new people in those environments? No, but the people that I had there, um, I definitely are continuing those relationships to make sure that they get to where we both mutually expected them to get to. And there's an accountability portion there, so it's good. Um, And I'm doing it newly now. I get some other younger technicians in this new atmosphere, and I find it to be we we relate right away, and and, um, we're going to make some good changes for those guys and girls as well. So it's good. Isn't it funny as we get older, uh, and really, you know, when you're younger, 
in, in just starting off in this industry, you're probably pretty aspirational. You're trying to get your certifications done. You're trying to get up to speed as fast as you can. Then you're trying to be as productive as you possibly can. But as you get older and you've kind of you've you've hit those milestones, your your focus kind of shifts to other people and trying to develop other people and and caring about other people. And I don't know if it's because when you're younger, you just don't have the ability or the knowledge to be able to to convey that. Or Mm -hmm. if over time, maybe it is something where you saw a mentor grab your hand early on in your career and you're trying to kind of emulate that. Uh, what, what causes that shift or were you just always that way? Uh, well, I, I, I believe that I've always really enjoyed the teaching aspect of things. I think, I, I think I've always enjoyed it, but I, I, I experienced that at a very young age. When I got into the industry, I found a technician in the shop that was the most productive, the highest certified. And I went from doing, you know, reconditioning vehicles into the parts department and then went out there and got on board and introduced myself and kind of made myself wouldn't necessarily say a pain in the neck, but I was, I was wandering around a lot. Um, but I was also the guy that was, when he wasn't looking, the bays were clean, the trash was taken out and, and there was stuff that people observed right away. And they were like, Whoa, wait a minute. You know, this guy's putting in a lot of effort. He's here all the time. And then it was, Hey, you got a second. Can you help me? Hey, you got another second. And, and it became more and more of like this. You build the bond. You, you, you go into a shop, you find the people that you know that are, hanging around and talking to the other people and they're very you know, um, outgoing and uh, yeah, you just, you just try to build that relationship and, it, and it's that aspect is a little harder today than it was back then. Um, back then there was a little bit more personable conversation and today there's a little bit less of that, you know, with, with uh, electronics, but it's still, it's still a really, it's a big skill to have. It's something you have to learn and develop because it helps you with your customers, helps you be a better employee. It helps you be a better coworker. Um, communication is a big thing to, to develop. So for all of you young technicians that are out there listening, Adam just hit on such a, an, an incredible point, which is he wasn't going up to this tech and acting like he knew everything. He wasn't going up and constantly nagging or constantly complaining. What did Adam do? He went and he made sure the bays were clean, made sure the get, the garbage was empty, made sure that you're, you're making that master technician's life easier. And for those of you that are looking for that respect and you're looking for that technician that might not be the kindest to you, in, uh, you know, right up front, that's the best way to earn respect is just work your tail off, do the basic things really, really good. And I guarantee you're going to get that person to open up a little bit. Mm-hmm. I agree 100%. And, that, and that's and that's and that happens in every show, in all the shops that I've been in, and I, even this last one before coming here, I had some technicians that came on board, and yeah, most people wouldn't have wouldn't have gave them a second look, but I, you know, they definitely, when you look over and they're they're cleaning tire areas and they're putting stuff away, and they're they're just taking their time that they're being paid for and using it wisely, and it makes the shop more efficient. Guys like myself look around and go, okay, the tires out of my way, the balance is cleaned up. The alignment rack looks good. There's stuff that I can get onto when I need to and just keep doing my job. Um, it does say something a lot. It says an actually a tremendous amount about the person. Um, so I definitely agree with that advice. Um, and there are, um, there are those guys out there in every one of these dealerships. I guarantee it. And don't just go out to look busy, right? That was no. one thing that I was probably guilty of early on in my technician yeah. career, which was short lived. And it's probably what because of that. But, you know, I think there's some level of anxiety of, you know, if if the manager walks out in the shop and I'm just standing here, I'm going to get chewed out. And rather than thinking about that, being able to truly think through, you know, if I if I do clean up the bays and I do this stuff that nobody's even asking me to do, you're going to make a positive impact on that shop. And, and just going out to look busy or, you know, when the manager comes out and you're on your phone flipping through TikTok or something and you quickly put it in your pocket, like that's not going to help, help you move the needle forward. It It is truly find that thing to do. If there's not a car coming in or a truck or whatever you're working on, uh, make sure you're doing the the little things to make the mm-hmm. shop a better place. 
Yeah, and I say that I got a couple of young guys now that just uh, I'm just getting to know and learn about in the last couple of weeks, and we've had a couple of interesting conversations. And 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 they are one's going into his senior year of high school, the other one's already graduated, and the other one already was in the military for a couple of years and has since gotten out of the military, and now he is working full time. So yeah, I got a, a little dynamic going on over there, but going over it with them. You know, they all feel the same way. They'd like to progressively move forward. They'd like to learn more. And my conversation thus far has been, okay, well, when those guys over there, are, you know, when they're doing tire rotations, when they're doing working on the cars, feel free to walk over and say, hey, can I help you rotate the tires? Hey, you want me to the tire pressure? Hey, you want me to take up this? You know, just get involved. Talk to them. Worst case scenario is they say no. Highly unlikely. Uh, and then if they do, just come see me, and I'm sure I have something else going on. But I also want you to come over and watch me document my stories and learn how to type and how to deal with the customer work, log on your repair orders. It's not all just fixing cars. There's a lot of dynamics to this whole thing. And I don't think that you think you'll learn it all. But it's funny how I can spend a day and put a kid on the computer and say, you stand here and you punch on every one of these ROs, you write the stories, you do the multi-point inspections, you do the videos, the pictures, like, and it just, Afterwards, they're like, wow, I'm just, I learned a lot today. There's so much going on. I said, well, this is every day. So, and it's good. And then it gives them an opportunity to see something different. They don't need to be changing all the day. So, it's good. That's not something you think of when you come to be a technician is the paperwork and <laughs> all of the, the, the little things that make such a big difference. And I know our educators out there are doing a great job trying to reinforce this with them. True. But I also don't know how much the, the students – take it seriously of like, this is a huge part of your job. And, and if you're doing a warranty repair, making sure that you document everything you did, because <laughs> if you don't, you're probably not going to get paid very well for it. And it's uh it's one of those super underrated things that for, again, those young technicians out there listening, little details, write yeah, a good yeah. RO, like that goes such sure. a long way. Well, and the, and the difference was is back then we used to say, you know, you walk into work and if you didn't have a pen, you weren't making any money. That's all they said it did. That was how you made your money. You had to be able to write your story, your complaint, cause, and correction. It's interesting how the industry has changed in the fact that, like, our warranty administrators, our warranty administrators back then were, you know, they they were ruthless. Um, <laughs> they were ruthless. They used to leave the RO in your death. They'd come out, they'd stand there and wait for you. They'd make you spill out your complaint, cause, and correction. You're actually been documented by hand. And then, like, it seems like a lot of warranty administration has gone to either third party or online or whatever. So, like, there's not as much accountability to actually document what you did. So, it's, yeah, it's a catch-22. Like, I, I want them to be able to do it because I want them to be able to talk educationally about what they did. Like, how, how did you how did you come to your conclusions and all that? Um and you're not handwriting it anymore, you're typing it, right? And there is a lot of companies out there that, you know, help backfill all that information in. Um, but it is really important to be able to explain what you're doing, why you did it, and um, that goes along for anything, really, to be honest with you. So. In the spirit of promoting all the great talent that we have in this industry, we're excited to announce the first ever Wrenchway Awards. The 2023 Wrenchway Awards will coincide with our first round of Tech Mission local events starting the week of September 18th. In select cities, we are awarding Automotive Technician of the Year, Diesel Heavy Equipment Technician of the Year, Medium to Large Shop of the Year, Small Shop of the Year, Outstanding Owner Award, Inspiring Service Manager Award, Rookie of the Year Award, Exceptional Educator Award, Best Mentor Award, and Standout Service Advisor Award. Nominations are now open through September 2nd, so submit your nomination soon. Link is in the show notes. I want to talk about patience, and I'm, I'm, I want to talk about it from two different standpoints. First, from the technician side, then from the shop side when they're bringing on a young technician. So much of a young technician and their ability to be successful, I think, comes down to their ability to be patient in those early years. I, I know for me and I know for a lot of my friends in the industry, you want to immediately go out and start diagnosing things and start doing big repairs. And in many cases, you're just not ready for it. How do you coach a young person to, to maybe be patient in their training, learn to do it the right way, 
learn to do all these little things really, really good while also knowing, hey, you're going to work your way up. You're going to get better at this stuff. And I think a lot of times they'll say, well, if I'm on the lube rack or if I'm sweeping or doing something that's not working on a car, I'm not learning a skill. And so many of us are so impatient and we want to get to that next step. Uh, how do you how do you kind of teach that patience? Is it something that you can coach them on? Or uh, I, I, I honestly, I know this is a very loaded question, but it seems like it's one of those things that young techs really, really struggle with. Well, I, again, I, it goes back to after 25 years of doing this, I still change oil. Um, and it's never going to change. It's never going to go away. Um, should you be... That work, it's kind of interesting because I've always said, and I was actually taught by a, a dispatcher I had a long time ago who said to me, the more time you're standing in front of me, the more opportunities you have. And that's a very simple statement. Um, and if I was able to get through the work that's there, because it all has to get done. It's not that it's, you know, we can't just put it by the wayside. We go out and we do the work. And the quicker you do that work, the opportunity for you to try something else or go work with somebody else and do what they're doing uh, presents itself. So you have to have you, you have to have your own initiative and the patience comes it comes it comes with being around the right people. And like I said, I think there's certain people in this industry that do this right and that will go along and take a take a student under their wing, um, new hires. It doesn't even need to be somebody who's in college or in high school. It could have been somebody that came in from a total different job. Um, you just they are this is what they this is their calling, this is what they wanted to go do. You gotta spend the time to give them the chance to see if it'll work out for them. Um, but the patience out of it is that you just, you're going to learn, but feel free to um, get the work done that needs to be done, do a good job doing it, and a reputable job. And then when you have your downtime, as opposed to like you were just saying, the TikTok, and the, go stand by a technician. Hey, can I hook up that scan tool for you? Hey, what are you looking at? Is there any way you can talk to me about it? What are you, what's, what's going through your brain right now? And they just, I mean, like I'm sitting there a lot of the times, I'm just, regurgitating the thoughts that are going through my head. And as long as you're standing there, you're probably learning something. You're learning something. You're probably watching me log in and look for certain aspects. Where do I find these recalls or this TSBs and information? Just just watching, just observing. Um, and I think that it has changed like to what you were saying. I think that the opportunity to move forward is there. Is there expressed? There is expressed. It will be there. But the guys and girls are going to express and work really hard at it and show that it's going to be a career are not in there long term anymore. Not even close. One of the areas that I think is pressured by lack of confidence in an early technician or a technician in their early years is the ability to take a step back and think. You know, so much of our industry talks about every minute counts, every second counts when you're in the shop because you're in a production environment. You're trying to get as much out as you can. And if you're that young technician that maybe doesn't have the confidence level yet, I think it can be hard to take a step back and think through something because you're trying your tail off to just keep going and going and going and trying to do a good job. Mm -hmm. But at times you don't do a good enough job just kind of sitting back and thinking through a problem and thinking through maybe the theory of how a system works or thinking through, you know, just a general failure analysis, right? We're, instead, we're just conditioned to just attack whatever and go as fast as we can. But in reality, you're, you're kind of putting yourself behind the eight ball a little bit because if you were able to just take a step back and think about it a little bit more thoroughly and slow down your mind a little bit, you're probably going to be in a little better spot. It's super funny too because a lot of the times – when I experience those with younger students or younger employees, they come in and they have a concern about air conditioning or something like that. It's funny you say that because that's exactly, that's exactly what takes place. They're working in my spare bay and I'm working in my bay and they're over there as they're working. They're like, Oh, I, you know, the customer came in, they come up and they read the complaint to me and I say, okay, walk me through an air conditioning system. What's going on? And they just start trying to figure it out. And as we go, I'm like, okay, well, where's the change of state? What happens here? What goes on there? And we, it's like literally teaching a class. It's a, it's a, it's a crash course in AC in about 30 minutes. And by then, at the end of it all, they go, they learn, they learn a lot. They, they do learn a lot. And there is chances for that to happen. You just have to find 
it's not even really a responsibility of you to find that it's the right person. You just have to be willing to listen to a little bit of the bickering and the whatever, but to, to know that the, there's a light at the other end of the tunnel, like just take the information and try to process it uh, in a different way. And you're right. They, you're hourly. Majority of them are hourly. Not all are flat rate right away. And if they are and they're inexperienced, it's probably not the right shot fit for them. If they can't be productive, that they just may need to see the writing on the wall there. There's a lot of shops out there that do, um, you know, at least a minimum of 40 hour guarantee with some kind of production bonus. So if you're in there and you're working hard, you make 50 and you're there 40, they'll pay you more and that's fine. There are other ones that just do a straight hourly. And at that point in time, you're not under any major pressure to not to do a good job. Like you, you can do the good job and still be able to maybe ask the people around you for the right questions as long as you're willing to do the work. Um, it's always easier to go to the guy next to you and say, hey, how do I do this? Or you say, hey, I did X, Y, and Z, and I'm stuck. And at that point in time, that's when the other technician goes. He's basically saying that you know he needs the help, and then he actually puts an effort in and they're more willing and more apt to help you in that aspect than if you just say, what's the answer? Because they weren't given that answer. <laughs> so that information is power. To them. <laughs> it is. And I think the beauty in how you approach that is you're making them think through it. And you're not doing it because you're saying, well, I learned the hard way. You should learn the no, hard way. No, you're, 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 you're trying to get them to think through a system so that the next time they get that AC problem that they can actually Correct. think through it on their own. And maybe they're not going to get it the next time, but they're probably going to get a little bit closer and a little bit closer and they're getting some confidence. And the more you can get them to critically think through a problem, the more success they're going to have for the long term. And, and even just basic scan tool operation and things like that, where you're going on, there's so many different scan tools out there. There's different softwares and having them get just comfortable with that. You know how much easier it is when they pull the car in and they put they plug in the scan tool, they perform a health check, and they look through and they get their codes and they they have information to provide back to me, but yet they have they expose themselves to all of this technology, and then it's like, hey, go, you know, they, you can't launch the space shuttle from this, so just go ahead and log in and turn it on and look at it and play around in there because you're not going to break anything. We're all set, and then come back to me with the information that you just got from a tool and tell me what you learned from it and is there any technical service bulletins or recalls like that stuff all comes up now walk me through your process and we'll continue to grow from there it's really simple yeah and i think for you shops that are listening out there helping them out and trying to really get a feel for a diagnostic process up front can be so game-changing and maybe they learned it a little differently at school or they maybe the school didn't teach them well you know in terms of an actual diagnostic process but when you see that experienced tech out there going through the same process every time i think that's you can get it to click in that you know it's almost a checklist in your head of okay we got to hook up the scan tool we got to you know do a uh just kind of uh look up uh uh, look up recalls, look at, you know, kind of going through your entire process uh, mm -hmm. can help a young person out so much so that they're not just looking at the scan tool blindly. Uh, they actually have a process and they understand why they're looking at the scan tool in the first place. And you can also, I mean, again, the other, you have a shop foreman, uh, a team lead or somebody in the shop that doesn't, and, and, and actually pulled back from that because I wasn't, I wasn't a team lead for years in the middle of there. And I was, there are other people that are not in those positions that do enjoy teaching and that do enjoy getting involved. Find as a service manager or service director, find those people and then say to those people, you know something, I'm going to pay you an hour. I'm going to pay you two hours at the end of the day. And these three guys are going to hang out with you and you're going to teach them how to use a scan tool. And those three guys learned or two hours at the end of their day, how to use a scan tool. And the next time that that job comes in, the guy next to them, and they're like, hey, I can help you do that. They feel confident with hooking up the tool and going through it. You're trying to train these people to learn to do a job that is, in their mind, very large. It's very, very large. And they want it broken down into a lot smaller scenario so they can feel, like you said, confident to be around those people and have conversations that are substantive. And... What's wrong with a little bit of in-house training? When did that cost anybody any money? 
You know what I mean? So it's good. I think this is maybe a portion of the industry that's gotten a little bit better. We still have a long way to go, but there are so many unsung heroes in shops across the country that are helping younger people out and not getting any recognition for it, not getting any additional pay, and they're doing it out of the the, the goodness of their heart. And uh, I think that's got to change, right? Because we, if if somebody's taking care of your younger people and you're not paying attention to it or you're taking it for granted, uh, you're doing yourself and your shop a disservice because they deserve a ton of credit for doing that. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. I agree. And, and what it, when you look at the attrition or hiring and how expensive it is to bring people on and onboard them and, and have them be there for less than 60 days and leave you and you're going back out and you're hiring it, where, when you look at it, you sit down and you cost analyze that, how is that ever any better than sitting there and investing in what you have sitting right in front of you? I mean, the, the, the expenses, is, I mean, and, and the other thing too, I know it sounds kind of crazy, but like those relationships that you and I discussed before, there is a lot of trade schools and a lot of high schools and a lot of places in those areas right there that would do things with you and, and for advisory meetings and you could get, have access to their shops. You could bring those guys over there. You could, there's just so the possibilities are literally limitless if you want to put in the effort, but that any that effort, from, any effort, really, <laughs> I mean, really, it's being honest though, right? It's really any effort. I mean, there's not, there is so many, like you said, unsung heroes, but there are a lot of good automotive instructors out there that are out there in the college programs that are in the high school programs that are in the trenches with these guys and girls and they are teaching them what they can and they're trying to get them. You know, we went through an advisory meeting with a bunch of kids that they are all coming out of the program student level ASC certified. Now, most people would say, what value does that have to me when those students come on? But the last three students I've had come to me as a hire, as a new hire, have come in with all eight student level ASCs. They got those before they left high school. That just means to me that they have a, a really good knowledge of something that they put in a little bit of extra effort and they feel like it puts them a step up in front of somebody else. That means that they're already taking the pride in the work that they're doing. There's no, there's no limit to where they're headed. There's no limit whatsoever. So there's and, and good it, things out there. It doesn't mean they're going to know everything. And I think no. you'll, you'll go out to some Facebook message board and you see all the discussion about ASEs and oh, this person has all the ASEs and they don't know anything or vice versa. Mm-hmm. They don't have any and they, they're really good tech. Like you said, I think it's just showing initiative that they're That's doing something and they're trying yeah. to, yes, they're trying to get better. And you hit on, an, <clears throat> excuse me, another key point there that I think is really worth talking about. And this is something that I see consistently across the industry. The best shops that are out there take developing young people seriously. Mm-hmm. The shops that I don't think are top tier shops are the ones that are just constantly trying to find that next A or B level tech. Like they they have the blinders on. They don't think about the long term. They're thinking about the immediate need and not fully understanding that if they don't change their ways, they're just going to live their life in misery <laughs> trying to find technicians for the rest of their <laughs> career rather than simple. actually taking like an actual like planned well thought out approach in working with the schools and going to the advisory committee meetings and, and networking a little bit. And, you know, when they don't do that, they make our industry look lesser, right? They, they it make does. the industry look kind of almost cheapened, I guess. I don't know if that makes sense. No, no, it doesn't. And I would say up until probably, I would say 2013, 2014 is when I started getting into the high school. Um, and I was going to advisory council meetings. And then I, from there, went into college, uh, some of the college ones as well. And then some of the national ones for for um, for the product uh, that I was with. And all those advisory councils have learned a ton. And I would yeah. say in this last this last round here, the last couple of years, my previous employer, my manager got really involved um, significantly. And he was going to the meetings and, and he was seeing, he, it opened up his eyes. He actually said when I was leaving, that, that was one of the things that he just really just got a lot out of. He went to all those advisory meetings 
We did so many good things for the students. We gave, we donated all kinds of equipment. We donated cars, we donated tools. And then we brought that back in house and then decided to, when we onboard you know, new technicians, um, that like we said, the point of entry was just expensive. So we went, he went ahead and put together tool carts. We put, you know, 1500 bucks, maybe two grand into a tool cart. It was a regular, you know, cart with the regular hand tools that they needed and some air tools. And we had those carts set up. We had numbers put on them. We had keys to them. And when they came in, they just grabbed that cart. They went to work and they got an opportunity to see if this was what it was, but they didn't have to go out and spend that much money uh, just to start on day one. I mean, like that's, it's a hard thing to overcome. So I would say, like I said, the industry is changing there. There are some managers, people that are out there that see that value. And as they see the value, they're seeing the return on that investment, a tenfold, ten, tenfold. So it's really yeah. good. And again, going back to how we started this portion of the conversation, it takes a little patience. It takes a little work. But if you do it the right way, you're going to have a much cleaner system, a much more professional system, and a much more consistent system at producing good technicians if you actually take this part seriously and you do get involved with schools and you are you know, actually having some training for uh, for the students and, and the entry-level technicians. Want to win cash while helping the industry? Check out our game on Wrenchway Shop Talk called The Loneliest Number. Each week we post quick poll questions about industry topics Technicians who answer the questions will earn points to play the Loneliest Number game for a chance to win our $1,000 monthly prize. $500 will go to the lucky winner, and the other $500 will go to a local high school program of the winner's choice. Start playing now at wrenchway.com slash shop talk. Link is in the show notes. Now, I want to go to the other side of the patient spectrum here. And one of the concerns that I've always had about our industry is the amount of pressure and the amount of expectation that we as an industry have for that young person coming into the industry. There are still a lot of shops that as soon as that tech starts, whether they've got one day experience or uh, 30 years of experience, they're expecting them to produce right off the bat. And we're really bad at kind of eating our young up and spitting them out. My buddy George Aarons at ASC talks about it all the time. And I'm interested to get your perspective on this and how you view this in terms of having patience with a young person so that they actually have the time to grow into their own and, and grow their skills and learn, not thinking that, hey, they're going to be an expert diagnostician right off the bat, like it takes time to get to that level. It's hard because a lot of those people that are doing that, a lot of those managers that are doing that just have the wrong mentality to begin with. Um, they go into it just with a, with a very um, a different expectation. And they didn't, they didn't actually explain the expectations of the person that they were hiring. And unfortunately, those people end up um, suffering from that, which is not, a, which is not altogether, just not a good atmosphere. Um, I think you, you know, if you're looking for that, that's where you got to go find, and they have to bring in the qualifications to do that. If for some reason they told you that they had that capability, that's that's a very interesting scenario. But one thing that I've always found that has been super beneficial and it's always worked is what I call discovery days. And those discovery days are, I take a technician in with me for a day, no obligation. You're not hired. You didn't sign any paperwork. You put on a pair of safety glasses and make sure you have the right shoes on. You stand over here and you follow me through the process. And we're going to have a conversation about what the expectations are, what you're doing and how that's going to go long before you're sitting down filling out any kind of employment paperwork. We're talking about a five, maybe six hour, maybe seven hour portion of the day. They didn't lose anything. We didn't lose anything. We may have actually gotten a bunch of intel and a bunch of information from a technician like myself who had a conversation with those people that actually said, and I, and I heard them say, key points of interest of what they've done, where they've come from and whatever. And in the process, I'm almost vetting them while interviewing them, while they're vetting me and interviewing me. And we're all, we're all there for a kind of a similar reason, but nobody's invested yet. And then eventually if that works out and I walk into an office with a manager and say, wow, it was unbelievable, great conversation. 
does X, Y, and Z. This is what he's into. We're, 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 we're starting to have a different dialogue. Um, and that student or person may leave there and say, wow, that was super overwhelming. And that is not what I'm looking for. <laughs> not every single shop is meant for every single person. They are, there are bigger volume shops that just don't have the capacity or the ability to train. And there are some smaller ones that don't either. So it's, it's just, a, it's just finding the right fit. Um, and there are enough of them out there that um, you should be able to find the right fit. I love that you use the term discovery day because I, I think that would go so far for so many people. And as the technician shortage has gotten worse, I think so many shops hire on desperation and are very reactive. And even if that tech that comes in is super talented, if they're going to be abrasive with the other techs or not fit in culturally with the other techs in the shop, that throws a curveball that can be really, really damaging to a, a, a service department. If you're driving away your best techs because you made a hire that is not getting along with everybody else, mm -hmm. but you did it just because they had that technical skill set, I think you upset the apple cart a little bit. You do. Yeah, you do. And, I, and I, it's, it's really, there's no investment in, hey, I got this guy I'm looking to bring on board. He's got a couple of hours. I want him to come in and just have a conversation. You know, even looking at the current position I'm in now, when I went there and they owned a they owned another dealership, I went in and had a conversation with the shop owner of the other dealership. We sat down and we talked and we just we just gelled for a bit about you know what his expectations were, how things gone for him. He's been in the same building for 24 years and done X, Y, and Z. And hey, how you know? So if you're not gathering information before you sign the paperwork, it's just more crucially important nowadays, in my opinion. Um, and educating the young, like I've, I've had the conversation with my advisory councils about that too. Bring that up to your students when your students are there. I've gone to um, in-house training days at high schools and I've shown kids how to do, you know, ADAS and different things that kind of they would be interested in having conversations with. And I've, as I've had that talk with them, I've said, come up and visit. Don't be afraid. This is a giant facility, but come up and visit. Go to the front door, ask for me. I'll be there. And we'll take a look at the shop and you guys get an idea. And I swear that last, I think you and I discussed last time, that last time there was two of the girls, two of the guys, they showed up that same night and they were like, you said, we can go up and take a look at the shop. I'm like, come on in, come on in, let's hang out. So they all hung out at the shop with me for about an hour and a half. And we, yeah, we just chilled. I showed them everything I got going on. They got a chance to check out the toolbox. We walked around the shop. I showed them where the part stuff is and where the clean cars and how we, you know, go about it. And, I mean, one of them clearly came right out and said she was going to diesel. She was going, she was going up north. And she was, that's great, phenomenal. That's awesome. But she just wanted to see the inside of a shop. Okay, that's you know. cool. Uh, same with everybody else. I think you just got to kind of help them. Just take that pressure off. Uh, there's no reason to have that kind of pressure on there anymore. This industry isn't. Yeah, it's just it's different. It's different. And in my opinion, it is. Is there a lot of still old world uh, industry? Yes, there is. There is, and there's not much we can do. We can only just try to change what we can change, control what we can control, right? So, Key point you hit on there that I think is really important is that you were a friendly face in a big dealership that if you're not there, the chances that those young people come in the doors to go even check it out are zero, right? right. It's some of these dealerships are just gigantic and they're very hard to navigate, very intimidating. Mm -hmm. And if you're 19, 20 years old or, or younger, if you're 17, 16 years old sure. and you don't have that friendly face saying, Hey, I'll meet you at the front door. It, it can be a really intimidating experience. And that friendly face comes from those advisory councils. It comes from yes. those advisory councils and it comes from going back there, you know, starting September one school opens. Guess where I'm headed. I'm headed into the schools and I'm going to go hit two or three of them and we're going to hang out and I'm going to go to their advisory councils at what time at night on my time when I have the chance to go see those people. And then while I'm in there, I'm talking to other people that are from the industry that are all there with the same invested interest. And then what we do is we schedule out our time from there to December and we all each go in and I take a day and I go in and talk to the class about what I do, how I do it. I'm very transparent. Ask me whatever, what do I, what do what difference does it make? You tell me what you're looking for for questions and I'll answer them. And then let's go in the shop and let's learn some stuff. You guys are out there doing some live work. Some of the schools I have do live work all day. 
let's go fix the car together. Let's go talk. Let's go hang out. So those things are really, really important, especially for managers and things like that, to go there, take a technician, learn what they've got going on. There is such a need. I have programs currently here that have 60-plus technicians enrolled in them. 60 plus technicians. Are they all going to post secondary? No. Do I need 60? No. But I, there's an opportunity there, I would find. And it has paid dividends because these kids have just naturally moved up and, and done what they needed to do. So it's important, really, really important. Well, and if you, you're not swaying all 60, but say if just based on a conversation with you, you sway one, two, three people to go okay, into yeah. this industry, that oh, yeah. makes a huge difference. It does. And, and I mean, and I'm there to, I'm there to provide information to them, like you said, as a comfort level, right? I'm trying to bridge the gap. Are there guys and girls that ask me about, you know, going for power sports? Yeah, we got a power sports program. I don't know anything about it. I'll help you get there. I know the guy who runs it. All of, you know, like there is people that are, there's other avenues that these kids want to travel. Are they going to go for Toyota? No, they want to go for Volvo or, or Kia or Chevy. I, they just want to ask somebody who's in the industry how it works. And uh, it's really tough not to just sit there and answer their questions. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's pretty crazy. You know what I mean? I bring in a bunch of free hats or tools and let them all have fun. It's like, and they, they really just they enjoy it. They enjoy it a lot. Well, that stuff comes back full circle too. That person that might be going for power sports, maybe it doesn't work out there and they want to come. They're going to remember that conversation they had with you or that lady that went to go into the diesel business. You know, it, it, I think, I feel like that comes full circle so much. Two years down the road, my four wheeler or my dirt bike breaks and the guy down there, I walk into the shop. I'm like, wait a minute. I know that kid. <laughs> I talked to him a few years ago and that kid goes, Hey, that guy's the one who pointed me in the right direction. All right. Now what's yeah. happening? You know what I mean? It always comes around. It's a small world, man. It's a crazy small world. So, well, that's stuff. where that's where good shops can take complete advantage of that scenario, right? Because there are still a lot of shops that don't treat their technicians the way they should. And if you're just a, a good dude that answers their questions and helps them early in their journey, and they go somewhere else and they're not treated well. Uh, you know, I have to imagine they're probably reaching back out with a phone call. Hey, do you, oh, yeah. do you have anything open over there? Yeah. Yeah, no, they do. And they, and they, and they are, um, and when they travel, like, you know, I've had some leave, some go down south and some go to different shops. Some people leave the industry entirely, but I've also yeah. had a lot of, I've had a lot of wins. I've had a lot of these guys and girls come back in and just hang out on their day off doing whatever job they're doing, whether it's, you know, carpentry or whatever they decide to go do when they come in and they, basically say their conversation or their year or their time with me was x y and z and this is what they they just learned so much and they just and i've had plenty of them come back and say thank you which is literally the probably one of the driving reasons why i continue to do it because it really just that one thank you you're like you know some that person is right. married they have kids and they have a life ahead of them and they're doing what they wanted to do and maybe me telling them that this was the right decision or not or is, was what changed that for them whatever you know like that's not an easy world. So setting them up for success as they move forward in this industry. Uh, one thing I like to talk about is kind of awareness of tool debt. And when some of these young people come out, there are there's some pressures from the tool manufacturers, who, whoever it might be, you know, that big 50% discount that they get when they're in school. We all had it when we were in tech school uh, <laughs> to buy all the tools. But Oftentimes you see somebody buy a bunch of tools and figure out afterwards that it's not the right industry for them or they're buying the wrong tools. Uh, I look back to my own experience growing up in a shop. I think I was about 14 years old and bought like an $85 set of uh, Mac screwdrivers, which was pointless at that point, right? Like I just <laughs> get the craftsman. Right? Nice <laughs> get, get, nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, still have them, still have yeah, them, exactly. but it probably exactly. wasn't the greatest time to buy them. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and that and, and, and that can be difficult too to navigate the you know the, the overall cost and what you're trying to where you should start. Like where is where is the, the best point of entry in that? And you're right, there is there is a lot of different options now than there were before. And the fifty percent off that those students are getting in college programs is actually what cost was back when we were there. So we were getting fifty percent off of that. They've doubled, they've tripled, it's so expensive. 
I literally went to look for a stock I said the other day. I said, you know something? I'm look at this impact set that was in a catalog. And I said, is that, that's, that can't be correct. That can't be correct. <laughs> and I walked out to the tool guy and I said, is this, a, is that mysterious? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, wow, what is that? Like, that's crazy. Uh, that you can't get a kid one socket sets. Yeah. Just too much. So yeah. my advice to them too, is that you end up finding preferences along the way, whether you're, if you can find a dealer that is willing to do some kind of incentive program, whether they already do have the toolkits, like my previous employer, they've got them set up. They're there. They're giving you the option to come in. Those guys and girls that have been working on those tool sets for maybe four or five months have now decided to start to get their own stuff because they feel like they want to, this is, this is the direction they're going in. And now those sets become readily available and then you get that opportunity. If not, you know, go with the, the basic guidance of the people that you're, you know, you're employed with. What, what is essential? What is an essential? And, you know, again, for school programs and stuff like that, there are lists that they give out that you have requirements for that. So, um, but yeah, it, it's definitely, you know, there's definitely less expensive ways to go about it um, now, but um, you just have to be uh, a little more calculated with, you know, who you talk to and how you go about it. It's hard, right? Because we've all walked on that tool truck and you see all the shiny stuff <laughs> and you, you, the nice toolboxes and, and everything like that. And it, it is really nice stuff. That's the hard it part is, is Ed, when it they're is like, sweet. yeah, you know what? You can get this for 20 bucks a week. You know, we're just going to stop. And I, it's unfortunate when you see, you know, I, I had a friend that was a uh, snap on dealer and still is. And okay. he used to uh, just kind of laugh and say, you know what? I'm just basically a, a rolling accounts receivable. Van. <laughs> That's it. And, That's and, it. and so you, you just want to bring awareness to those young people to not put themselves in a bad position when they do eventually get married and have a family and, and want to grow in their career. Uh, they, they can do it smart. They don't need all top line stuff right off the bat. They, they can get by with maybe some lesser level stuff. And, you know, I, I just, uh, I use my, my own experience as a reasoning for talking about it because, mm. you know, it, if, you got to make sure you're actually going to like this and that it's going to be a career for you before you start investing in those tools. One of the best things you can do. And if you can find it, and I, if you're in high school, you're in college or wherever, just take one financial course, just take one yes. financial course to go online and take one financial course. It's what, what's the credits three or 400 bucks to pick a college. I don't really care where it is, but take one, entry level financial course. And from there, you will be making decisions for the rest of your life that are going to benefit you. And it's going to pay you dividends. The issue is a lot of guys and girls get into this industry and they don't, they do exactly that. They get on the trucks like, Oh, okay, I can run this up, run that up. And then there's expenses. And you got to understand that there's, you know, yeah, there's, there's a better way to approach it. And there isn't a lot of people that will tell you that. Um, and that's unfortunate. But a lot of the, you know, guys and girls out there that I've had come through have bought secondhand toolboxes, look at, you know, secondhand this, go online. Someone's, some of the guys are always phasing out of the industry. What do they got going on? Yep. Get what you Garage need sales. to get by. Yeah. Get where you need to get by go and get the stuff you need to just do the job. It doesn't matter what it says on the handle. It does the same function. It's actually the person holding it, whether they know how to use it or not is the question, but Really, it's a um, those financial woes are something that this industry puts people in, which puts a lot of pressure on them. And then when the pressure's on them, that's when the attitude and the patience fall completely by the wayside. And so. why do you think some of these young tick young techs skip around between shops? They, they need Dolls a raise to cover. They need yeah, they, they need a dollar. They, yeah. they need to cover their tool bill. They need to cover you know maybe a car payment, whatever. But if you yep. can do, and I've seen more and more shops do this, and I think it's brilliant, which is offering financial education courses to their staffs. And whether it's a, a Dave Ramsey deal or having your financial advisor come in and, and teach a course you All know, there. a couple times a year, just being able to put yourself in the shoes of that young person and really trying to set them up for long-term success, I think is really, really key to their happiness moving forward. Yeah. I mean, if they're financially, if they're financially secure 
or learning how to become financially secure. And they actually go in there every day and do the job, and they're just not under that. You, you, you get somebody who has a great attitude, who's willing to pass that stuff on to the next person who wants to work with them, and then they're just not under that same pressure. They're making good financial decisions, and they're going to be very successful in that position, in that role. But when you let them try to figure it out on their own, um, that literally, like you said, patience comes with having a better understanding of what's going on around you, right? That's really what, where it drives from. And if you don't have that better understanding, your patience level generally is not there. Um, it's very, very hard to deal with. So, Well, this is great advice. And I feel like we have so much more to cover. I, I hope you'll <laughs> join us again. Hopefully it won't be three years the next time that we get you back on. But no, 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 I, I, um, one of them. I think, I think actually did, we did, uh, did we end up doing that round table too? Did we do yes. a round table somewhere in the middle yes. of that too with a couple of the guys? That was pretty interesting too. Yeah, good group. We'll get you back on a round table for sure. This was such yeah. a, such a great conversation. And I, I think such a great podcast for that young technician that's out there to listen to because Adam had so much good advice over the course of this episode and things that he's gone through and things that he's, he's seen other techs go through. And mm -hmm. I, I think I, I really, really hope young techs listen to this episode because it was outstanding and what you're doing out there in, in, being involved with schools and actually caring about our younger people in the industry is setting an example for what everybody else should do. So bravo to you and everything that you're doing. And, you know, from on behalf of Wrenchway, wish you nothing but the best of luck in this new gig at, uh, at Kia. Uh, you're, you're just doing some amazing things and, and we can't wait to, to talk to you again. Yeah, absolutely. No, I appreciate the time. And uh, yeah, I look forward to it. It's, uh, it's, it's going to be a good, uh, it's going to be a good challenge. So we'll see. Keep it posted. <laughs> yes, we will. We'll we'll uh, we'll we'll stay on top uh, of everything that you're doing. But thank you so much for coming on, Adam. We appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank you, Jay. That wraps up this week's episode of Beyond the Wrench. Be sure to tune in next week for another brand new episode. As a reminder, don't forget to rate and follow Beyond the Wrench on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps us get Beyond the Wrench in front of other fantastic shop owners managers, technicians, and dealers just like you, so we can continue to help improve, promote, and grow this amazing industry. Thanks everyone for listening, and we'll be back next week.